Hello, my name is Mario Bolai from the Data Science and AI Department of Monash University in Australia and I'm presenting joint work with my former colleagues from the Fritz Haber Institute in uh, Berlin and the Helmholtz Center for Information Security in Saarbrücken. Our work is called Identifying Domains of Applicability of Machine Learning Models for Material Science and the idea or the question that we're asking in this work is um, is it actually reasonable to universally or unconditionally accept or reject a machine learning model um, based on a single error statistic such as the mean error? Or um, can we do something smarter than that and can we try to systematic or identify systematic effects that we have on that error and uh, come up with the domain of applicability of a model and then work with the model in a more informed way? So let me try to embed this idea and this question into the standard machine learning workflow um, at first and then we'll see a concrete application of this idea to a material screening task. So um, looking at the workflow uh, for using material, uh, machine learning for materials uh, screening, um, this starts out uh, by fixing some domain of materials omega and uh, some target property uh, that we want to understand, let's call that Y. And then the idea is to use relatively expensive but relatively accurate first principles method to come up with a data set of reference computations that um, fits or that uh, serves as training examples for machine learning to learn the structure property relationship um, that we have uh, that we want to model. And the idea is then by um, fitting a machine learning model that we can afterwards use that machine learning model to screen large parts of that space omega um, for a fraction of the cost that we, it would have taken uh, to use the first, principle, uh, first principles method directly. In order to come up with a good machine learning model, there's usually a couple of engineering steps that we have to get right. The first thing is that we have to come up with a good representation uh, for the problem that makes it amenable to automatic parameter fitting with machine learning. So we have this step of finding representation R. And then of course we have to set up a good model fitting algorithm um, itself. And then in order to navigate these various choices that we have there, we then obtain a performance estimate of that model and that is usually um, the holdout test error that I can form as the average loss for some loss function that could be the squared loss or the absolute loss uh, and compute this on this holdout test set that has not been used so that's part of my data that has not been used for the model fitting because this gives me an unbiased estimate of how the model is really doing um, across the domain omega. And then I can make the choice if the model is good enough or if my performance estimate is good enough then I go ahead and use it for screening or if not then I can go back and try to improve the representation or the model fitting algorithm or I can even go further back and sample new <coughs> reference computations. So that's all good and well in a way but it comes with the implicit assumption that the error estimate that we're using there, the single error estimate, that this would represent the model performance or the losses well across the whole domain omega. So we make this uh, rather consequential decision whether to accept or reject the model based on this simple thing. Um, and perhaps in reality it might be that the error actually is not similar or the error distribution statistically is not similar for all the different uh, structures that we want to screen. Um, perhaps it actually is uh, what we call heterosedastic uh, uh, scenario where the model error changes uh, across the domain. So let me um, sketch out a single simple example that illustrates that scenario. Um, here we have a noisy third degree polynomial so that is we have a simple uh, joint distribution with three variables, two representation variables x1 and x2 and then we have the target variable y, which is conditionally distributed according to um, a third degree polynomial on x1 plus some um, noise term that is normally distributed, but the variance of that noise is increasing exponentially with x2. So now we end up in a situation by design where um, the model uh, 
uh, the model errors uh, won't be identically distributed across uh, the whole domain. Uh, let's see that. If we plot, uh, if we model uh, this uh, distribution by a standard approach, uh, here I'm using kernelized rich regression with a um, Gaussian basis function or a radial basis function. And so the model is here plotted in blue. And we have uh, training points already, uh, sorry, test points sampled. Uh, and these are colored in red according to the absolute error. And the first uh, thing that I can observe is that, um, not surprisingly, the errors tend to get larger if I move to the right um, in that space for larger x2 values uh, corresponding to the larger noise terms. Uh, on the other hand, I also have another interesting observation. Because of the sparse, um, sorry, of the uh, local basis function, so we have this exponential uh, decline in the basis functions, um, I have also problems modeling that uh, distribution in the sparse regime in terms of x. Um, so if I move away from the origin, I'm sampling here my points normally distributed around the origin, and as I move away also in x1 direction, I get into the sparse regime, and then these local basis functions have the side effect that my model is not capturing fully anymore uh, the variation of the third degree polynomial. So I have two factors here that somehow influence the errors, the two factors that I can um, express as uh, conditions on the covariates on my uh, representation variables x. And conversely, I can then, um, so I have this hetero, uh, heterosedasticity, uh, and conversely, I can flip that around and I can formulate conditions under which the model is working especially well. So if we see um, here uh, only this gray area in the surface, uh, and this is described by the simple logical formula that x1 uh, has to be, uh, the absolute value of x1 has to be uh, not too far or not too large. And similarly, the x2 value has to be not too large. Uh, and then we are in this area, and then um, if I plot out the error distribution in that gray area, so here this is in gray in this histogram, uh, in contrast to uh, the black distribution of the global error, I see that the local error inside uh, this subdomain is much shifted to the left, so the model is much more reliable uh, inside that subdomain. And so I could call this subdomain now uh, with some justification, the domain of applicability of the model, um, um, especially if I'm overall happy with the with the with the mean error or even the 95 percentile error um, in that subdomain. So that's the first thing. Once I know the domain of applicability, I can use the model only to predict the target properties uh, inside that domain of applicability or DA. And the second thing is that um, if I have a second model. Uh, like here I'm using a polynomial uh, model now, uh, I can also come up with the domain of applicability and then use the two domain of applicabilities to compare relative strengths and weaknesses of the two different modeling choices, starting from the representation. And in terms of the polynomial model, I have this interesting observation, for instance, that I don't have to have a restriction on the x1 value because I have uh, this global basis function here, so I can extrapolate into the sparse data regime. But at the same time, um, I have now a downside for this global function too, because the errors in the high noise regime also uh, influence the predictions in the low noise regime. So in contrast to the first model, I now uh, my domain of applicability now has a lower bound in terms of the um, x2 value. Okay, so this is the second application. And we see we have two advantages when we're using uh, these domain of applicability. So the first is, um, let me just jump forward. So if we identify the domain of applicability, then we can use a conditional performance estimate um, afterwards and only assess the model where it works well and only use the model where it works well. So that's what I mean here by if it's good enough, then we can perform selective screening also only inside the domain of applicability. Or if it's not good enough, respectively, um, actually, it's not even mutually exclusive anymore. Um, even uh, it is good enough, if it, if it is good enough inside the domain of applicability, I can then also focus on how to improve the model outside the domain of applicability, or rather, you know, extend the domain of applicability by systematically improving the representation, investigating this description or selector that I had for the DA. And finally, uh, I can also uh, redefine the whole 
learning task afterwards, I can say, okay, so for this DA, I already have a good model. Now I can go ahead and um, focus my screening or my, my new model building on the, um, on the rest of the, of the domain Omega and ultimately cover the whole space um, with a mixture of local models. So these are all things that I can do um, once I have this DA uh, described by Sigma. So this is the vision. Um, let's see, um, let's introduce, let's introduce a case study problem to illustrate uh, what this can do for us uh, a bit more concretely. Um, so we are uh, investigating here a case study for uh, discovering novel transparent uh, conducting oxides and in particular we're looking into this population of indium gallium aluminum oxides uh, that we want to screen across six different space groups and we want to understand the formation energy of these different polymorphs and um, so this this problem is taken from a 2018 Kaggle open uh, machine learning competition um, so we're using this because uh, there is quite a number of machine learning approaches that have been tried out systematically and optimized uh, for this data set. So it's good to have some mature models that we can analyze uh, with this domain of applicability approach. Um, what are these approaches? So they differ in the representation. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the uh, SOAP representation or smooth overlap of atomic positions. Uh, this representation um, captures the local bonding environments around each atom uh, in the material uh, by locally approximating uh, the density of its neighbors of the different atomic species and then representing these densities in a um, location uh, invariant or also rotation invariant uh, fashion. And the second representation or the second approach to modeling is the multi-body tensor representation or MBTR and here we obtain uh, translation and rotation invariant coordinates by um, uh, representing the material in terms of its distance distributions that I can that I find between the different atomic species and then finally we're looking into the n-gram representation where we map the material to a bonding graph and then count the occurrence of specific subgraphs in that bonding graph and each of these subgraphs gives me a representation coordinate. So these are my representations then uh, for the sake of comparability we're modeling in each case um, the formation energy with a kernelized rich regression model using Gaussian uh, kernels just as in the first example and then I can come up with my performance estimates. So in this case, we have 2,400 training points and 600 test points. And then using these 600 test points, um, I find um, the following mean absolute error. So I'm looking now at the loss function being the absolute error. And I find that first of all, the model performances are all relatively similar. Uh, so all around uh, the uh, mean errors are all around 14 uh, milli EV. Um, so, um, that is not necessarily good or bad in itself. Let's put that a bit into context. So first of all, the coefficient of determination is relatively high. Uh, one would be optimum in this case, so that's good. Another good thing is if I compare this to a simple benchmark model where I throw away all structural information and only um, consider the uh, compositional information as features, uh, then I end up with a mean absolute error that is four times or more than four times higher. On the other hand, if I look at the complete error distribution, and here I'm indicating this with the 95 percentile of the absolute error, and here I'm plotting out the complete distribution, we see that we have these very long error tails. So the mean uh, error is relatively small, but there is a relatively large fraction of my uh, test um, structures where uh, the error is relatively high. And to put uh, also that into context, uh, I have drawn here this horizontal reference line which corresponds to the mean energy difference across all considered um, concentrations between the, um, the ground state polymorph and the second uh, to minimum uh, energy. So if my error would be uh, in that area, in that region, then uh, I have a good chance of confusing the ground state polymorph for a specific, for individual concentrations at least. 
So um, that is then uh, quite discouraging in a way because then it looks like I have a relatively high probability for all of these models uh, to end up close to or beyond that reference level. So that's the global picture. And um, if I wouldn't have any further means of analysis, uh, well, I could just try the next thing or discard everything and start over. Uh, let's see now how we can do better with the domain of applicability. Um, first of all, we need to still uh, define an approach that is able to systematically identify domains of applicabilities for materials. So that task um, is uh, um, described as follows. So first of all, uh, we have our model and then we take a DA identification set. So that would be a subset of the test set so that we get unbiased error estimates. But we want to hold out a bit more data to also get an unbiased performance estimate afterwards for the inside of the domain of applicability. And then I want to define the DA. I want to identify the DA and uh, it should have the properties that first of all, the, uh, the prediction risk should be low inside the domain of applicability, so much lower than globally. And uh, I want the DA uh, secondly to be as large as possible, because otherwise if it would just be, you know, uh, uh, um, a very small area around a specific training point, that wouldn't be very useful to know. And then finally, uh, as we have said before, we want to describe the DA by a simple logical selector that is given in a language that we can later on use for uh, restrictive screening and also to do a diagnosis uh, about our representations. Um, so for that, one uh, general approach is to go back to features of the unit cell, like lattice vector lengths, unit cell angles, number of atoms, and so on, um, and use that as my basic descriptive features for the DA. Uh, I can also add a bit of compositional and structural information, of course. And then um, based on these features, I can come up with basic logical propositions exactly in the same fashion as in the example. So I say for individual variables, they are less than or greater than some threshold. And then my potential domain of applicability selectors are then uh, found as conjunctions of these base selectors. And the final thing that I have to define is an objective function that I, um, that I can use to select um, the best uh, possible or the best conjunction um, given my identification set. And for that, I can use the multiplicative combination of the two factors corresponding to these two goals that we had here. Um, the first is that the domain of applicability should be relatively large. So I'm using the probability estimate that something falls into it, the DA based on the identification set. And the second factor um, is the reduction in the prediction risk as estimated on the identification side when going from the global to uh, the local error in the DA. And um, this gives me now an optimization problem that I can um, try to solve algorithmically. Uh, bad news is that this is an MP-hard optimization problem, but um, this is a well-known optimization problem um, for which practical algorithms that in practice behave much better uh, than their worst case uh, have been found uh, and uh, namely uh, this problem that we have here is called a subgroup discovery problem. So the idea is that um, we have now here this table of uh, the basic propositions and they're either true or false for my uh, reference computations from the identification set. So in this example I have only six reference structures and uh, five propositions and then implicitly the subgroup discovery algorithm uh, is going to search through this complete lattice of all possible conjunctions that can be formed from these basic propositions. But of course, uh, doing that explicitly uh, would be uh, not a practical algorithm. Uh, what we do instead is we use this branch and bound uh, approach uh, on a reduced uh, search space. So let me quickly sketch some of these ideas so that you get a feeling for how this is done. The first idea is that uh, I can discard uh, so many logical propositions would describe the same subset of data points. And my objective function is ultimately a function of the data points that are described by the domain. So uh, the first step is to only choose a single representative for each of these logically equivalent representations. And then um, now I'm going to this branch and bound idea. Um, the, first, I, the first component is that I have to come up with a branching operator that technically implicitly organizes all the possible remaining conjunctions as a tree from which I can then on demand materialize certain candidates. 
but I don't, I don't want to materialize all of them. But instead, I use a bounding function. That's the second component of the branch and bound that can um, upper bound the possible objective value that I can still find in specific subtrees. And then given that I have already uh, a current best result during my search, I can use this bounding function to reduce by a lot um, the conjunctions that are that have to be technically tested and uh, evaluated to find the optimum. And then in the end, I end up with uh, exploring much less of this worst case exponentially large tree um, for most practical scenarios. Okay, so this gives me a concrete algorithm to find the domain of applicability for materials configurations using that representation that we um, sketched a couple of slides ago. Now let's see how uh, this plays out or what do we get out for of this uh, in this scenario uh, of the TCO formation energy modeling. So here again the global model performance uh, in all cases and let's start out with looking at the DA performance for this uh, simple benchmark model. So in this case I see that now I have the domain of applicability error distribution uh, plotted in blue and I see that the distributions they are relatively similar so for the for this simplistic model, I can actually not define a good domain of applicability. But uh, looking forward to the n-gram model, here it already looks much better. So I reduced the mean absolute error from 14 milliEV to 10 milliEV. So that's already a good improvement. And also the same thing if I look at the 95 percentile. So the whole distribution is really um, uh, pushed downward to zero error. Um, so that's already interesting. So like somewhere in between, but uh, focusing on the most interesting case perhaps, uh, for the MBTR model, I see that um, the error inside the domain of applicability is just half the mean error uh, globally. And moreover, the 95 percentile now moved down from uh, 54 milliEV to below 20 milliEV. And in particular, below that threshold, that reference threshold that I explained earlier, um, relative to uh, defined based on the difference between the minimum energy polymorph and the second to minimum. So here in the MBTR case, I can now um, actually conclude that I can use that model inside the domain of applicability selectively for a confident estimation of the formation energy. That is uh, good news in terms of where to apply the model. On the flip side, of course, now I also have the DA selector to analyze the, the flip side of it, which is outside the domain of applicability. Um, it, uh, the, the representation uh, performs much less good. And um, so uh, I can now you look at the selector and start to hypothesize why this might be the case. So for instance, for the MBTR selector, we have here um, found uh, as one of the three criteria that you see in a selector that the number n of atoms in the unit cell must be large for the representation to work well. And now you can start to develop a hypothesis that this is perhaps saying that these distance uh, histograms or these distance distributions, they don't really work well for sparsely occupied unit cells. And that gives you an idea of uh, the cases that you could try to repair to come up with a better um, representation. So with that, I want to conclude my talk um, just in summary. So our idea was that, um, that the error distribution of machine learning models can in fact vary across the domain that we're modeling. That phenomenon is called heterostaticity. And then um, we can turn that around and say, okay, if the errors vary or there are systematic causes for error based on our representations and other choices, then we can turn that around and find conditions on the covariates on the domain that define the domain of applicability of the model. This can be cast as a subgroup discovery problem and solved efficiently in practice. And then once we have these domains of applicability, we can use it for selective application of the model, selective screening. We can use it to do focused resampling, to remodel the parts outside the domain of applicability. And finally, we can use it to have a targeted and systematic improvement for our different design choices. With that, I thank you for your attention. I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work in this conference. Thank you very much.